Greetings and welcome, everybody. My name is Naveen Pereira. I'm an assistant professor of medicine and pharmacology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And today on Medscape, we'll be discussing a very pertinent and interesting topic on coronary calcium testing with my colleague, uh, professor of medicine, uh, strong research interest in preventive cardiology, Dr. Iftikhar Kalu. Uh, and uh, he has especially uh, um, uh, shown an interest in uh, using biomarkers for identifying cardiovascular risk. Welcome, Dr. Kalu. Thanks, Noreen. So uh, let's go straight into the meat of the matter, if you may. Uh, why do we see calcium associated with atherosclerosis? Sure. Uh, calcification is part of uh, inflammation and repair processes, which are ubiquitous in uh, atherosclerotic lesions. And in fact, calcification occurs early on in atherosclerosis, but uh, we are not able to detect it with imaging until it increases in uh, quantity. And that occurs typically after age of 40 in men and women. So we can detect that with imaging uh, in that later years, but it's present in the very early stages of atherosclerosis. So is CT scanning amongst the most sensitive imaging technologies that we have to pick up calcium? Well, at this moment, it is the standard uh, test to detect coronary artery calcification. And what we've seen through uh, even um, uh, histology confirmation is that it accurately quantifies the amount of calcification. And as you know, uh, by um, uh, quantifying calcium, we get an idea of how much atherosclerotic plaque burden there is. And although it's not a marker of plaque vulnerability, but by telling you the extent of disease, it does give you a, an insight into the patient's risk. So I order a calcium score, Dr. Yeah. Kalu. Uh, how is that, what do I expect when I look at the report? What do I see? Well, the two things we need to consider. One is the absolute score. And then the other is the percentile for that person's age, gender, and now even ethnicity, we can percentile to those three factors. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what, we recommend, what we consider abnormal is anything that's greater than the 75th percentile for age and gender and ethnicity, or an absolute score of 300, which is what's mentioned in the guidelines. Some people have an issue with that. They would say that any detectable or even any calcification score greater than 100 is, is abnormal. Mm -hmm. And the scoring is based on um, you know, the intensity of the calcium signal and the area of, of uh, where th that signal is. So in essence, it gives you the quantity of calcification present. Mm -hmm. And so how strong is this data linking calcification that's identified by CT imaging and real clinical outcomes? Well, what the, should the practitioner believe in sure. that, how, that association? Sure. So the, the recent guidelines for risk assessment that came out recommended four modalities for um, for uh, scenarios where there's uncertainty about the patient's risk. The mm -hmm. first one being coronary calcium, uh, family history, C-reactive protein, and then ankle brachial index. Of those four, the strongest data are for coronary calcification. And it's clear that this is by far the best um, modality in terms of uh, refining risk estimates when, you, when you're not certain about the patient's risk or when the patient's in an intermediate risk score. So data, the data are pretty good, and in fact, a term that we use is how often does this classify or reclassify individuals when you're uh, um, uh, assigning risk based on risk calculators, and it does that fairly often. In the MESA study, for example, 25% of the time risk was reclassified based on the calcium score. And in fact, in the intermediate risk group, it was uh, even more so, in nearly half were reclassified. So the data are very good that it is a marker of adverse outcomes that goes above and beyond what you can get from the risk calculators. So not only does it identify atherosclerosis, but it identifies the possibility of real events, uh, adverse cardiovascular events that can occur in that particular person. Exactly, because it gives you the extent of uh, subclinical disease, and that in turn obviously uh, determines the prognosis in that patient. So with the incremental value of getting a score by doing coronary calcium mm -hmm. uh, imaging, uh, with other risk factors. Can you integrate uh, risk factors with coronary calcium? Would that make it uh, a better predictive tool? 
That's an excellent question, and I don't think we really know the answer. So, for example, the guidelines say calculate the risk using the pool cohort estimator. And then if you want to do the coronary calcium um, score, uh, it's not clear how we should integrate that with the, the uh, pool cohort estimate. One suggestion was to use the vascular age that you derive from these imaging modalities like calcification or carotid ultrasound, and then put that age instead of the chronological age. The other um, uh, uh, su uh, suggestion has been that we use the relative hazard of having an abnormal coronary calcium score. Let's say that the relative hazard is two times uh, what would be expected. Uh, uh, and then you would multiply your pooled estimate with that relative hazard. So if the patient's risk is 7.5% over 10 years, but they have a high coronary calcium score, that would essentially double their risk. So you would now mm -hmm. estimate their risk to be 15%. Uh, there are some issues with these, and we, at this point, don't know exactly how to integrate coronary calcium score into the baseline of the pool cohort estimator. So what did the guidelines say, uh, Eftikar? So it's interesting. The guidelines um, gave it a 2B, which is a pretty good recommendation, but not a flat-out 2. Uh, some of the concerns were that they didn't have enough data for what is the relationship between uh, excessive coronary calcification and stroke, as you know the new guidelines incorporate stroke as one of the adverse outcomes. Mm. They also feel that there's um, more, data, uh, more data that are needed for, <laughs> excuse me, for, um, uh, uh, you know, the, whether you can actually change outcomes when you do coronary calcium scanning. You know, there's still mm -hmm. trials to be done. And then secondly, uh, you know, the degree of reclassification, I think, still needs some additional data. There are some additional concerns, you know, cost effectiveness, the cost, the radiation, and that may have, you know, tipped it to, into a 2B category rather than a 2. And I know many people in the imaging world are somewhat disappointed by that. They had expected this to get a 2, and they actually would, uh, many in this area would prefer that risk estimation should basically be driven by imaging and, uh, you know, in, in most people. Right. And so, we are traditionally taught that if someone has higher coronary calcium scores for age and sex, et cetera, adjusted, mm -hmm. uh, we should m go towards getting a non-invasive uh, stress test, for example, right. uh, to see what that means. Mm -hmm. Does that really translate it into ischemia? Is right. that still generally the approach? Or? That's a very interesting question. Um, and the, actually, the relationship is not linear. It's quite non-linear. Mm. And um, I have patients in my practice that have very high coronary scores, calcium scores, in excess of 1,000. So they're above the 99th percentile. But when I have imaged them, you know, even with the perfusion or um, echo uh, stress, mm -hmm. they have no um, well, is inducible is at all. Yeah. And I, I think this is because some of the excess coronary calcium um, resides in the, uh, in the, the arterial wall remodels, what we call glago, glagovian remodeling. And as a result, the lumen um, uh, remains relatively uh, non-stenotic, but the excessive calcium is present in the wall, mm. and thereby you don't get any inducible ischemia, at least to the extent you can detect on these imaging modalities. So there is not a good linear correlation between the extent of coronary calcification and whether or not you will have a positive stress test. So you may not have obstructive disease mm -hmm. um, resulting in inducible ischemia, but you still have atherosclerosis and you're still at higher risk. Exactly. So what do you do uh, after car with these patients then? Well, you know, the, the, if your risk uh, absolute co coronary calcium score is greater than 300, you are almost like a coronary heart disease equivalent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your risk is 2% per year. Right. So you would probably want to treat that as a coronary heart disease risk equivalent, you know, the very highest risk category, so with, with moderate to intensive statin treatment. So aggressive lifestyle modification and all the preventive measures we know in exactly. trying to control the disease. Yeah. Uh, so how do you use uh, coronary calcium in your practice? Because I know there are always these gray situations that come mm -hmm. up. Maybe you can illuminate some of these cases that sure. come up where you found this helpful. Sure. Um, in my practice, I try to avoid it at the extremes of age. So typically, I won't do it in individuals that are less than 40. Okay. There is some concern that they may have plaque, but it may be softer plaque without that amount of calcium that you could pick it up. So you right. might be lulled into some sense of, insecu of insecurity. Right. 
At the other end of the spectrum, I generally won't do it in older individuals, like you know people that are older than 65. I don't find this to be useful because actually, if you do the pool cohort estimator, they're already at a certain <laughs> level of risk, risk. where you, you have to treat them. So I generally use it in, in that age group of less than 65, greater than 40. Okay. Um, and I find it quite useful actually when, when you're not certain about that patient's risk. So there's somebody whose pool uh, cohort estimator places them at low risk, but they have a strong family history, or they have uh, you know women with inflammatory disease, for example, systemic lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, this mm -hmm. could be a modality. Um, and you know chronic kidney disease. Um, and so there are multiple scenarios where uh, I, I find it useful. And uh, family history being probably the most common one. Um, and so um, I see a, a fair number of individuals that have family history of early onset disease. And uh, I uh, um, yeah, am finding this information quite useful to see if the genetic predisposition actually translated into excessive coronary artery disease burden, in which case then, even if their risk calculates, uh, puts them in the low risk category, I would certainly treat them aggressively. So for example, if you're on the fence regarding committing them to lifelong statins, right. that would be useful. Exactly, because you, you are actually you know, ma embarking on what could be lifelong therapy with a medication which you know is not completely free right. of side effects. And so as you know there's also an emphasis emphasis on shared decision making in the new guidelines. So that um, helps you know when you visually demonstrate to the patient right. that this is the amount of uh, calcification of plaque burden that you have and that helps with that uh, the patient then uh, to make mm -hmm. that decision to uh, with the physician to whether or not embark on that lifelong therapy. Perhaps improve compliance too. Exactly, and in fact, there have been studies trying to establish whether showing patients these pictures right. actually helps, motivates them to do lifestyle changes, which as you know is extremely difficult. Uh, Iftikhar, why not just do CT angiography with the calcium scores too? What do you think? Well, CT angiography is a valuable uh, you know, um, modality, uh, but it's more, I think, its place is more in the emergency room uh, you know, where you have chest pain, individuals with chest pain, and even outside of the emergency room, you, you can use it in select situations. But uh, it does entail more radiation, more contrast, and uh, I think you can get pretty good information uh, with just plain uh, coronary calcium scoring in, in the majority of individuals that you're seeing for preventive care uh, in the clinic. Uh, so I think that the calcium uh, and the, the CT angiography is valuable, but um, I think the applic applicability of the plain coronary calcium score is much wider. Uh, I know there's some interesting trivia about coronary calcium from a historical perspective. Uh, Eftikar, can you uh, uh, shed some light on? I, I, I suppose you're alluding to the the, the mummies. mummies. Yes, yeah. yes. So that's quite interesting because. Uh, in the Egyptian Museum of Antiquity, they have, um, they have actually CT scanned several mummies, I think up to 50. And the surprising finding was that nearly half of them had coronary calcification. Wow. And in fact, uh, mm -hmm. I think the, the, the oldest recorded case of coronary artery disease is one of them. It's a princess mm -hmm. who lived about 1500 years, uh, 1500 BC, and she had pretty extensive coronary calcification. And they presume her age was maybe 45 to 50, and that was surprising because one assumes that they ate you know, a, a tr trans-fat-free diet right. <laughs> and had physical or physically active. And true organic food. True <laughs> organic <laughs> And so there are some theories whether they were, um, maybe had more inflammatory burden or maybe there were some pathogens that were responsible as to why. But it does point out that atherosclerosis was present in the antiquity and you know, it's not a, merely an epidemic of uh, modern, modern times. Great. Thanks, Iftikhar, for these great insights, and thank you, our viewers. We hope that you will continue to check uh, out future content on Mayo Clinic's page at theheart.org on Medscape. Thank you for spending your time with us.